Got a lot of slides, so we'll try to move through quickly. A lot they of this already, is... They already used up a minute and a half of your time bringing that up. That's just not right. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. Most of this is just a, a repeat, so we can move through the first several slides in a hurry. Uh, so the question is, is it disorder versus disease? So varicose veins are not classified as venous, insufficiently, venous insufficiency unless they have another associated manifestation. So the CAP classification is how we, how we grade these problem. So C0 is normal, C1 is telangiectasias or reticular veins, and then C2 is if you have varicose veins that are greater than 3 millimeters in diameter. C3 is if there's edema, C4A is pigmentation or eczema, 4B is when you've got skin changes which includes lipodermatosclerosis. So C5 is a healed ulcer and C6 is an active ulcer. Uh, so telangiectasias size-wise are 0 0.1 to 1 millimeter, Co color is red and purple, not really palpable. Reticular veins are 1 to 3 millimeters in diameter, greenish blue discoloration, and again, not palpable. And then the varicose veins, greater than 3 millimeters, usually not uh, discolored, and generally are palpable. So the most common manifest manifestation of primary chronic venous disease is varicose veins. More than 50% are bilateral. Clinical presentation is variable, sometimes minimal or no symptoms. Sometimes people do have localized symptoms, pain, burning, itching. Uh, sometimes you have global symptoms, especially associated with venous insufficiency, achy legs, fatigue, swelling. Women are more prone to these symptoms. Men do develop symptoms after varicosities, have enlarged sufficient size to increase pressure on the somatic nerves. Symptoms are generally worse at the end of the day, and there's a poor correlation between the size of the varicose vein and the symptom. So most often varicose veins, again, benign process. Large varicosities can cause skin changes and ulceration. 17% of venous ulcerations have isolated saphenous vein reflux as the cause. And 33% of patients seek attention for cosmetic reasons. Uh, risk factors, so 15% of patients are 25 to 35 years of age. Most patients are older, between 55 and 65 years. Uh, pregnancy increases the chance of varicose veins, 15% with one pregnancy, 30% with two. 60% with three. Uh, it's hereditary in most cases, both parents with varicose veins. 90% risk, one parent is 50%. If no parent has varicose veins, then it's about 20%. Again, female gender uh, increases the risk of uh, varicose veins. And then occupation, long periods of standing or sitting increases the risk. Uh, and only 6% if you walk frequently, so walking is a good thing. I think we went through the anatomy, so we can probably skip through this. Uh, this is, again, just a picture of the superficial veins uh, that we went through earlier. This is the saphenal femoral junction, uh, which is an important landmark for treatment. Again, this is just another diagrammatic of the superficial compartment and the deep compartment. So this is, I think we went, we went through all this with the saphenal femoral she, the small saphenous vein we also went over, again, starts at the outer ankle and empties into the deep system behind the knee. And again, the, deep, the, thing, to import, the thing that's important to know is that it's relationship with that sural nerve. Uh, again, this is the connection of the small saphenous vein dumping into the popliteal vein, usually at the level of the knee. And there are valves, kind of what the whole problem is. So there are multiple one-way valves throughout the superficial and deep venous system. So actually it's designed to create a one-way direction of flow and prevent venous insufficiency. Uh, the calf muscles compress the vein. They push the blood out of the leg, and the valves keep the blood from flowing backwards when the muscle relaxes. So again, this is why occupations with walking tend to reduce your risk of varicose veins. So venous return, again, it's based on the calf muscle pump to pump the blood out. Residual force from the heart for contra heart contractility. Then also negative intrathoracic pressure helps pull the blood up. And then the valves maintain unidirectional flow. When you have vascular, sorry, valvular dysfunction, it leads to venous hypertension. Again, it could be in the superficial veins, it could be the deep veins, or also in the perforating veins. Uh, again, the saphenous vein is the most common uh, vein that's affected. So if you have incompetent venous valves, again, the blood flows in the opposite direction, resulting in increased pressure in the lower leg and symptomatic symptoms then develop. So where does it start? In most cases, it's below the knee, saphenous vein, and it's almost 70%, above the knee in half, and the saphenofemoral area is about 
Usually it's a local or segmental process and can start anywhere. So histological changes in the vein, you have thickened enzyma, adventitia fibrosis, you have atrophy of the elastic fibers, and you have reduced smooth muscle content, and you also have an increased collagen to elastin ratio. Pathophysiology, vein dilation seems to cause valve dysfunction, not vice versa. So the treatment, elevation, standing and sitting are the worst positions, and then compression, graduated pressure, which means higher pressure at the foot and the ankle and gradually tapering to a lower pressure as you move up. This accelerates capillary flow and filtration and also reduces edema. Uh, this is just another schematic of how it works with higher pressure, lower down, and then kind of gradually reducing the pressure as you move up the leg. Uh, so based on your CAP classification, you can kind of determine what pressure you need at the ankle. So class A, 10 to 14, and as you move up in disease severity, you gotta start increasing pressure. Uh, obviously, as you increase in pressure, you probably reduce compliance. Uh, so drawbacks, they're uncomfortable, they're too tight, especially here in Houston, too hot. They're too hard to get on. A lot of patients just say they just can't get them on. Uh, sometimes there are contraindications. If you have weeping wounds or severe PAD, uh, you might not want to put a stocking on. Again, so failure, failure of compression is almost always, uh, in most cases, due to noncompliance. This is, again, that sequential uh, boot that people have what I've had a couple patients try it. Actually, works pretty well to reduce edema. And usually, lymphedema clinics are where they get them from. Because you just look like a goof with that thing on. <laughs> <laughs> you do. So you do it at home. Uh, drug therapy. Uh, this is really not. Again, pentoxifilin or trental has been combined with compression. Improved ulcer healing versus placebo. Uh, relative risk of 1.3. There's little level one evidence. There are some venoactive drugs available in Europe, Daflon. Uh, procedures, sclerotherapy, which irritates the endothelium and subendothelium, causes the wall to collapse and obliterates the lumen. Uh, agents, uh, osmosis, which dehydrates and destroys the endothelium. You, hypertonic glucose is the agent. There's also a lot of detergents, which acts on the lipid cell membrane. Enantholium, I can't even pronounce that. Ethanolamine oleate. So the technique for sclerotherapy is you have the patient stand for about five minutes, you give a test dose, and then you ensure intraluminal ejection, you aspirate before you inject, and then you wait. Complications, you can have hypo or hyperpigmentation. You can have skin necrosis, blisters, and phlebitis. So telling genitations uh, treated with sclerotherapy, you can see a before and after, it's highly effective. So reticular veins, again, before and after, works pretty well. I just stole this from the last slide, so I didn't want to treat sick patients, so I drew the line at ugly. <laughs> uh, again, this is just kind of a little bit of the history of treating veins, stripping and cauterization of varicose veins. Started a long time ago, and now, you know, became more common in the 50s. So saphenous vein stripping, I don't think I've ever seen this since a medical student, but stripping versus high ligation received excellent results, 94% versus 40% in high ligation. So you get a much lower recurrence rate and higher immediate success rate. The operative techniques, you make a small groin incision, uh, extensive tributary ligation, you divide the saphenofemoral junction, uh, you put a stripper attached inverter to the level of the knee, and then you remove, you just pull like a lawnmower. It's horrifying. It's fine as a student. <laughs> so high ligation needs to, leads to a high recurrence rate. Neovascularization can also lead to recurrence. This is just a picture of how it's done. You essentially slip your catheter down the vein, put the mushroom cap on, and then you just pull hard. Nobody does it anymore. No, no. that's true. Uh, Saphenous nerve injury occurs when the vein is usually a vole 7 to 13 centimeters below the knee. Occurs in 60% of patients with saphenous vein stripping to the ankle, and only 6% of those patients reported that lifestyle was affected. And stripping the saphenous vein to the ankle is not necessary. Usually to the knee is sufficient. So endovenous ablation, I think this is kind of where I'd say almost everyone does these days. Causes thermal damage, intimal destruction, collagen denaturation of the media, and then fibrotic occlusion of the, vessel, of the vein. So there's two, two major ways of doing it. There's radiofrequency ablation and endove endovenous laser treatment. Uh, so this is just the market share of the, the systems that are out there with venous being probably the most common. 
Uh, this is a guy I just borrowed this life from last year, and apparently the reimbursement's pretty good, and that's why you see so many people doing these procedures. Cynical. <laughs> What's that? That's, that's cynical. It's, it's to help the patients with their really complex problem. That's right. <laughs> And again, this just kind of goes to show that as reimbursements went up, all of a sudden there's more procedures being done. Uh, so the main, 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 what am I trying to say here? Sorry. Diagnostic <laughs> test. Diagnostic test. Duplex ultrasound is kind of the key to, to managing these patients and treating them. So this is one of the things that we were stressed as a fellow was you, you got to get familiar with using the ultrasound to guide your therapy and to really make yourself successful and avoid uh, complications down the road. You know, when you do the scan, you can identify DVT. Again, you can see the saphenous vein and the valve function. You can see reflux. Poor prognosis in these patients if they have a history of superficial thrombophlebitis, DVTs. If they have significant deep vein reflux, previous ulceration, or they have an AV, AV malformation. Uh, so things that kind of make things a little bit more straightforward is if there's a relatively straight vein, no thrombus, no aneurysms, the vein size is greater than 12 millimeters, and then post veins. So the way it works is uh, the two medicine anesthesia is what makes this done as an outpatient. So a lidocaine epinephrine solution injected into the perivein tissue to prevent uh, dermal or saphenous nerve injury. Again, the main thing is when you're using the ultrasound is to really get a good halo around the vein so it can really protect the skin and also you get a good, good treatment. You can use a regional block or general anesthesia, but generally with light sedation it's fairly well tolerated. So the steps of the procedure, you access the vein. Again, uh, I've always done it with ultrasound guidance. It's, it's just the safest way to do it. Uh, pass a guide wire up, put your sheath in, and then you advance the probe to the saphenofemoral junction. Uh, and again, this is, I like to do the longitudinal view to really see the catheter tip, make sure I'm far enough back from the, the femoral vein to reduce the risk of me getting a DVT in the common femoral vein. Uh, so again, the catheter tip is positioned about one centimeter distal to the inferior epigastric vein. And then for the small saphenous vein, you want to be 10 to 15 millimeters distal to the junction. Uh, position the patient in Trendelenburg, and then go ahead and to mess in anesthesia. So again, before you start ablating, always recheck your position at the common femoral vein. And then you ablate the vein, pull them back. Uh, the catheter is removed. And then you want to re-image at the end to make sure you got a good seal. Uh, as you're doing this, you can do adjuvant therapy with avulsion or sclerotherapy. Uh, so for the multiple st for the phlebectomies, you can do multiple stab incisions or needle holes. You place them near the varicose vein and then take a, a vein hook and just start pulling away. We've got a few more to go. So radiofrequency ablation is venous medical technology. Lab initially experimented with creating a competent valve. Uh, it didn't work too well. The FDA approved radio frequency ablation back in 1999. So computer feedback control, these are the advantages. It's bipolar, electrothermal energy, transmural heating of the vein wall. It minimizes spread of the surrounding tissue. You have to use a six or eight French catheter with fanning electrodes to engage the vessel intima. And the generator creates the heat. So closure fast is most people use seven French sheath. You treat seven centimeter segments at a time and treats vein diameters between 2 and 15 millimeters, and you can essentially treat the entire vein in about 3 to 5 minutes. We kind of went over this. And then endovenous is FDA approved. Again, 810 nanometer wavelength, laser energy delivered through a 600 micrometer fiber. It causes the blood to boil, results in steam bubbles, which cause collagen contraction and endothelial damage, and then similar positioning as for the RFA. It's faster than the original device. It's Again, there's no vessel size limit. Post-procedure care, graduated compression stockings. We usually tell people two weeks continuous, and then when walking or standing for six weeks. And then usually get an ultrasound about three days after the intervention to make sure there's no DVT and you've got good closure. Complications are minor, bruising, bleeding, paresthesia, phlebitis. Major complications are DVT, and again, it's pretty uncommon at zero to six percent. A PE is very rare. This is just a picture of an ultrasound that was done post, which shows the clot extending in the common femoral vein. So excellent short-term results, 97% vein inclusion at one week, and most remain closed at six months. Long-term results are very good, generally better than vein stripping. Follow-up as long as three years shows a very low recurrence rate.
Thanks, Dr. Patel. That was very good. So.